What is going on, everybody? It is your boy, Master Signified Bodies, back at it again with another banger. So we're going to do things a little differently. And like, again, with this channel, I'm going to try to evolve and, you know, adapt and learn from any of the feedback or any of the errors that, you know, is bound to happen with, you know, a developing channel. And so I want to make sure that things are very informative. But at the same time, I don't want to bore people and I want to make sure I'm addressing the audience. I want to make sure that I'm attacking the core concepts without bastardizing the value with, which Lacan brings to the table. And so in this one, it's still going to align with our seminar series, but rather than give an entire lecture on the entire chapter, I want to just condense it down to the core concepts as much as possible. So pretty much to give a, a, a summary, a recap, if you haven't seen any of the prior videos, I recommend go see them, you know, to get a, a great understanding of what Lacan is doing in seminar one, the return to Freud, Freud's papers on technique. But with that being said, if you saw the, the beginning of this video, you'll see what is going to be discussed and that is the inverted bouquet but the name of this this uh seminar or the name of this video seminar is mirror stage and the inverted bouquet so what what does that have to do with anything well to understand what lacan is is trying to build up in the ego he wants to show that the ego is a misrecognition We've talked about this before, and the resistance is that the ego's resistance are a nucleus of symptoms. It is the, the major system of symptoms, a conglomeration of symptoms, but it is the symptom of all symptoms par excellence. It is what pretty much is what makes us human. Not only that, but the symbolic order. The fact that we are immersed in this network of language and our discourse is speech which brings out the fruition of the law or of language and so when it comes to the uh the mirror stage right it's like one of the famous concepts everybody's heard of the mirror stage for you know their intro to lacan at some point or they've heard the mirror stage if they are somewhat familiar with psychoanalysis right Pretty much the mirror stage is, you know, when you go to the gym and you see that one bro hogging up the whole space of the dumbbell rack and he's just checking out his biceps and just flexing. And the first exercise he just did was dumbbell curls. He didn't even hit the bench. He didn't even hit his, his freaking uh, compound movements. He's just doing bicep curls and he looks like Larry the Lobster. Like his, his legs are skinny. <laughs> no. So... The mirror stage, right? It was a concept that Lacan was working on in, say, the year 1936. And it went through a couple revisions. And then he actually gives a, you know, a discussion of it in 1949. And the essay of the mirror stage and the function of the eye in psychoanalysis, not eye as in your eyeball, but like the letter I, like the, the ego. It was uh, published in the Acree, which some people say not to read. Don't read. Just fuck with the seminars. I'd say read essays of the Acree that align with whatever given seminar you know, you're working with. So since this is seminar one, I personally like to read all the essays that lead up to seminar one or, for instance, function of field of language. And speech is literally a couple months before this seminar was, you know, taking its its place, and it, and it definitely helps. Like Jacqueline Miller says in the commentary of uh, Return to Freud, reading seminars one and two, that you should see seminar one as the sequel to the function field of language. But yeah, get this bad boy right here, the Acree. Anyhow, so mirror stage, what the hell is it? Well, according to Lacan, animals go through the mirror stage as well, or they have some utility to seeing their image, but they discard it. 
it's humans and, and, and that babies somehow in their development, if we could call it development, go through this certain phenomenon where they see their image and they are entranced by it. They are pretty much caught in the spec the spectacle. This it's a trance. And you know, if you look at even now it's like people love the mirrors. People will criticize their image or be infatuated with their image. You know, they have to make sure they look good. You know, they comb their hair before they get on camera or they get on uh, get on stage to be filmed. You know, they have to make sure that they put on their makeup or the right shirt or outfit before they get their picture taken. You know, the image, the reflection has importance in our lives. There is a libido investment to it. And that's the key term is libido, which I'll build up on that in a second. But just to bring it down to earth, like, just think about it. How, how has your image or even your mirror reflection been an influence in your life and formulated a perception about how you see yourself? And I even talked about in the beginning, the, the dude flexing in the mirror at the gym. How many times do you go to the gym and you see people hogging up the mirrors and they need to lift in front of the mirror? Now, granted, I do it sometimes. And it's because if I go to the AstroTurf area where all the 45 pound bars are and I want to do deadlifts, I'm doing it because I need to check out my form. But sometimes I'm just like, you know what? I don't even care. Like, I trust that my form is well. But I bet you if you go to the gym next time, you're going to see people just staring at themselves in the mirror. And then not only are they staring at themselves in the mirror, but they're staring at other people through that mirror to make sure that they are, like, in a sense, being watched. It's like, oh, you know, I got to make sure that they're looking at me as well. So you see, like, if you just take this little advice that I'm giving you and you go, go to the gym, you're, you're now a Lacanian, you know? <laughs> but so when it comes with this baby that sees itself, its own reflection for the first time, this is um, an overall seductive image in which now there is a dynamic process of libido investing into this uh, primordial spectation or it's, just, it's like you're now a spectator of an image and the libido of the baby now gets caught in the circuit of this primordial image uh, what's interesting about the mirror stage is that or just even the formulation of the I or the ego compared to earlier psychoanalytic theories of the ego or ego psychology or even philosophy like this is something that's in opposition with the cogito, the I think, therefore I am. Like this presupposed I is not the center of the universe or the center of your world. It's actually decentered. It's actually a misrecognition and a false mastery over one's body. Because one thing about the mirror stage is that what's being identified with is the image of a fragmented body. You're not seeing the totality of your body. You're not seeing the whole thing. You're only seeing just this frontal area like face all the way down to the torso and the legs you can't see the other side you would need another mirror but then it's like now you're splitting the body even more so it's constantly fragmented but this internalization this reification of this primary uh this primordial image which creates the eye this is what would be called primary narcissism to uh lacan and it is the secondary narcissism in which now it's reflected upon one's environment, but the social environment. And I'm saying it like this because this is how it's worded in the mirror stage essay. And when we look at this, like we see how everything is centered around the image, right? So if we want to understand Lacan and his early works or just his works in general, this was something that was really helpful from Dangerous Maybe. You should look at Erlu Lacan prior to Seminar 1 and Function of Field as Lacan of the Imaginary. He's dealing with Gestalt. He's dealing with 
uh, Kleinian, uh, Anna Freudian theory, and other psychoanalytic theory. Uh, phenomenology is the, the main theme. Uh, from Sartre to Merleau-Ponty, to even messing with a little bit of Husserl and Heidegger, but mainly the first two, Merleau-Ponty and, and Sartre. And it isn't until seminar one all the way through like his middle and up to 11 is where it's Lacan of the symbolic. And two is really where he starts to get really invested into like describing the symbolic. And then you get later Lacan in which like from seminar 11 all the way up to the last seminar is Lacan of the real. And what's interesting about this seminar or seminar one, the chapter that we're about to tie in with the mirror stage and see the evolution of the mirror stage into this optical schema that we have right here. It's showing how the image or the imaginary is situated by the symbolic, right? Because the mirror stage of 1949 is still situated in the imaginary, right? But it doesn't show like why, because I said libido and its dynamic process. Why is libido situated in the ego to begin with, right? Why must it stay situated, right? Well, because the primordial identification with this image is going to be in a relationship with the mother and the baby, the mother getting its, or the, the baby getting its, drives immediately met the mouth drive the oral uh, the, the oral drive the anal drive etc are all getting its needs met through the mother this and then it'll identify its own image with the desire of the mother but it isn't until it's situated into language which we get to in this essay in which now there's the castration there is the cut off from that drive of libido into the ego drive. And so this is what's going to happen or it's going to be described in this optical schema right here. So I have two of them right here, right? Let's say that this one right here was SpongeBob, K-Man SpongeBob. This is libido situating itself, right? In the mirror stage, the primary narcissism, just pure animal drives caught in the spectacle and it's so confused it's like <laughs> <laughs> but that's the baby right here right so what the inverted bouquet is it's it's a representation of how we see the mirror stage you have the flowers and the vase right it's in a it's in a box it's inverted right here and it's in this like uh it's it's behind i think a mirror like a concave mirror pretty much and the reflective surface, but you'll see how in the reflection it inverts up so you see the actual vase and the flower stick up. So on the other side, you'll see right there that the opposite side of SpongeBob has the flowers showing up, but this is a, a virtual image. And so what Lacan is trying to show he, he says that, you know, think of the, these flowers as representations of our drives in the body and its unification into a false mastery. So the primordial narcissism or the primary narcissism in this primordial mirror stage is how we then begin to identify with the image of the body and it gives us the sense of mastery. And we are driven by this misrecognition. He will say that there creates a dichotomy that like, okay, so first there were libido drives, but then libido situates itself into the ego, which is the image of misrecognition. But then now there's ego drives. And he's saying like this, this is like what Freud was trying to get at. So what makes it really distinct? You know, what is, if libido is aimed at towards the drive of satisfaction and getting its needs met, what is, ego then to libido if if it needs just its satisfaction it's a paradox then it's like so what is the ego for the ego seems to be driven at something 
other than itself. It wants itself, but it alienates itself. So here comes the next part. So in the other image, we see Arnold Schwarzenegger running right here, right? This little cool one. I think this is kind of suitable. So you get like the baby's drives, and like I just call it animal drives, but you see the drives formulating into this seductive image. And what's interesting about the, uh, when I call the animal drives is the fact that in mating, animals will give off this seductive image of this dance to lure the mate in. However, with humans, it's like we're luring ourselves in into this spectacle, which we invest sexual energy or the libido energy into, and it creates this evil, uh, this ego, right? And, and it makes us the object of desire. But if it's a misrecognition, there's a dialectic. It's like where this, this error guides us towards something. It, it negates libido, drives for ego. And then right here, we could see the Arnold Schwarzenegger one as like what he will call the secondary narcissism. Because what's interesting about this optical schema is that so in the actual optical scheme of the book, where I put both Arnold and SpongeBob is an eye. And he's talking about a physical eye. He's not talking about this abstract eye as in like an eyeball. Wherever you see this optical schema in the inverted bouquet, you know, it kind of shows like, it kind of distorts the, the perception. So the greater angle that you're at, the better that you'll see the bouquet as realistically as possible. You know, this inverted image. Because the reality is, is that it's inverted. But in, in the reflection, it looks like an actual bouquet that isn't inverted. And here's the point, because it's, it's all about how your perception is situated. But what situates it? What makes one want to be situated? Well, that's the language. That's the superego. That comes from the secondary narcissism in which the castration occurs, which we are now thrown into symbolic discourse. We're thrown into the law. And I also think it's kind of funny and creative to put Arnold Schwarzenegger like that because now it's like it's a very like hyper real ideal in which now we're told we have to look a certain way, not for ourselves, but for the other, for the father or for the categorical imperative of thou shalt, thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that. So what the, the secondary narcissism shows is that now it's an alienation from the primordial or primary narcissism into an image to where it's not that we're just staring at the bouquet, but we want to know how we look when we stare at it or how we look in the eyes of the other because that's what's interesting about the mirror in between uh, the inverted bouquet and the concave thing on the left is that now it's like, you know that you see yourself, but you wonder how do others see me? But this doesn't occur unless we, um, unless we have language. And it's language which situates us and situates how we see not only the reality external to us, but then how we internalize it and how we orchestrate it through the signifiers, the master, the, the master signifier or the name of the father is the big other. And the other is going to be what guides our ego ideal of the social ego or social I as, as what he says in uh, the mirror stage essay. But in seminar one, in the optical schema topic of the imaginary, he's talking about ideal ego, which is how we see ourselves, right, as this position of mastery. But then we're taken out of this position of mastery by the ego ideal because we want to be able to have this image be projected into the eyes of the others. We want to make ourselves an object for the other. And so this is what he's getting at. And this dynamic of, you know, libido only strives for satisfaction, and but it isn't until desire comes in or language comes in that now it's a matter of fact of oh shit now i strive to do what the other brings out of me 
And, you know, it's not like and you could you could look at this as like how how when you're at work or or something like and this is what I like about Zizek. It's the in in modern and and you could say like modern authoritarian or like pre modern authoritarian bosses or whatever. Uh, they demand you to do something, and you have the ability to rebel. But like in this act of rebellion, it gives you some sense of mastery. But when the postmodern boss, or let's just say postmodern father, tells you to do something, not because they demand it of you, because they want to bring out the best of you, and he says it like this with like the difference between postmodern. Uh, I said bosses earlier, but postmodern father versus like the authoritarian father. Authoritarian father is like, you will go to your grandma's. I don't care what you say. You know, you may not like it, but at the same time, you have the sense of mastery in which you could rebel. But when the postmodern uh, father is like, you know, you don't have to go, but it would behoove of you to go because you know that your grandma is really sick and... It would make her very happy. So what's the difference between these two choices is that one is like you get the sense of mastery of, of your own self by negating the father. But what's being brought out of you in the postmodern one is the fact that you have to bring out the sense of enjoyment or the sense of want. You have this choice of free will, which bringing out your own autonomy. But it's really not. It's this illusion of that. And you can see the ego ideal doing that. Um in the fact that it's bringing out this force and alienating it from you, but at the same time, you reify it like it's yours, like you had the choice to begin with. And due to this sense of, of mastery, which is an illusion. And so this is pretty much this dynamic of ideal ego and ego ideal, the sense of trying to have mastery of yourself, but the mastery is never really there because it's an illusion, but at the same time, it's even being further alienated by the symbolic order, by the demands of the other, in which now you wish to see yourself in the eyes of the other. There's a lot. Uh, I try to make it more engaging as possible and simplify it down, but at the same time, it is a pretty interesting concept. And even the inverted bouquet is very hard to explain. Uh, there's just so much you could do with this. And I think it's pretty brilliant, um, a brilliant thing, which he will kind of hold on to for quite a while. So that's enough for today. Um, definitely looking at doing a different setup, trying to make it more relaxed and, and engaging. But at the same time, uh, I want to make sure that these concepts are not being, again, dumbed down to where the point it's bastardized. Because Lacan is a difficult thinker. But at the same time, he can be understood. You just have to engage with him. You have to read. You have to struggle and overcome and watch these videos. So if you like this, give a thumbs up. Uh, definitely subscribe. If you have any bitch moans, complaints, or comments, concerns, please let me know what I could do better, what you liked about it, anything that I forgot to say on the subject of the inverted bouquet. We're definitely going to go back to some of this more, and you'll see how this is going to tie in not only in this seminar, but for the rest of the works of Lacan. Anyhow, take care and enjoy your symptoms.